In this video, you're going to learn how to establish a rapid and powerful defensive position even when caught unawares by an enemy. And that lesson might prove helpful to you with this video's sponsor, Call of War. Call of War is a free online strategy game where you and up to 100 other players will all choose a real country to lead during World War II in real-time games that can last weeks. To take over the world, you're going to need to forge alliances and establish a long-term strategy as you declare war on your neighbors, building your army out of a variety of different units, from tanks and planes to atomic weapons. The games are massive, and you can play with the same account on both PC and mobile, which is a good thing as well, because you never know when the enemy might surprise you with a blitz. Follow the link in the description down below to get started with 13,000 gold and one month of a premium subscription all for free. But the offer is only good for 30 days, so you'd best hurry up with it. Thank you to Call of War for sponsoring this video, and now, let's get back to the 18th century. The sky is clear, the birds are singing, oh, what a beautiful day it is to be a young army officer marching with your brave lads through the open countryside. Oh, nothing could possibly ruin such a perfect day like today. Well, until that is, a rider comes up with terrible news. Unbeknownst to you, the enemy is nearby. Just a day's march away, you're told, and in overwhelming strength. There's no time to march back to the Star Fort from whence you came. What are you going to do? There's a brief moment of panic, but then you remember two vital facts that may just save your life and that of your men. That in your pocket is a fascinating little book on field fortifications, and just a mile or two back, you passed by a beautiful little church. Well, the priest may not think kindly on you for it, but you know what you have to do. Until the enemy should pass, or your relief should arrive, this house of the Lord shall become a fortress for the army. Regardless of the theology behind such use, it may, may be a little dodgy there, uh, with some dedication and a little bit of time, even a small force could convert a church into a versatile and powerful military strongpoint, able to serve as uh, maybe a redoubt to slow an enemy's advance in a siege. It could be a supply depot, really anything in between. They're very versatile buildings, as we'll soon enough see. Uh, in many villages of the time, the church may well have been the only building, or at least one of the few buildings, that was actually made out of stone or brick. They may also be the tallest structures for miles around, and whether they're in the town itself or a little outside of it, they usually had stone walls surrounding their churchyards as well. And all of this, along with many other potential advantages, were not lost on military theorists of the 18th century. And there were multiple guides on field fortifications from many different nations which all discussed the methods by which a church might be thus converted into a killing zone. And some of those methods were honestly really brutal, uh, in a way that honestly might surprise you. There was one or two things in this account that surprised me coming from the 18th century. Uh, and to show you all how it's done, I'm going to be pulling from an essay on field fortification, a book that was written by a Prussian officer and translated by Mr. J. C. Plato in 1768. Uh, now, if you'd like to read this book in full or any number, any, any other uh, of a number of different, you know, guides on field fortification and such, um, well, I'm going to list it and a few others as free PDFs at nativeoak.org forward slash library. And so with that, let us begin. On arriving at the church you seek to fortify, it is vital to examine carefully its natural situation, for should there be any stone or brick buildings within musket shot, or if it is commanded by neighboring heights, the best disposition will signify nothing. The post must always be bad. But if your church is located in an open field with only a few trees or smaller structures around it, well then it should perform quite nicely. Next, examine your men. Compare their strength to the size of your chosen field. Will they be sufficient to man the walls and defend this post? Well, if not, you must move on. But should there be sufficient strength, both of body and mind, well, then you might proceed with the nasty business. Without exception, your first order must be to blockade all the roads and avenues leading up to your defenses. Move heavy wagons and carts into the road. Make sure to remove their wheels so the enemy can't easily pull them away. You can also use larger trees. Cut them down and drag them whole onto the paths to disrupt enemy movement. 
and then reinforce these rudimentary defenses with simple siege works. Chevaux de Free will slow them down further, Abati and other detritus will cut at them like a mesh of barbed wire, and then along the paths the enemy is most likely to launch their assault. The author even recommends digging True de Lou, which translates to wolf holes, although you may better recognize them as tiger pits, deep holes dug into the ground with spiked stakes at their base, and if possible, as well you might plant fugas, underground charges of powder, to explode when the enemy crosses over them. And along the most narrow paths, such as perhaps alleyways leading up to the churchyard, well, you might block them up with harrows, a sort of agricultural tool which might be gotten from local farms and fastened to the ground with stakes. Yeah, uh, so-called gentleman's warfare? It could be just as brutal as the rest of it. The point is to do everything you possibly can to disrupt the enemy, using every possible device which serves to impede or encumber their passage. And above all else, make sure that of all of those obstacles, they're all going to be in musket shot of the churchyard, because otherwise, the time that they buy you are going to be short and not worth the labor that you're going to spend actually constructing them. But if the enemy is trying to clear away those treacherous paths, if they're trying to step over around obstacles, over debris, and they're being forced into narrow avenues of attack, and all that while they're being actively fired on from your men who are in a position of cover, well, you can see the advantage there. But just because you've frustrated the enemy's advance doesn't mean that they're beaten. There is much more to be done if you are going to survive, and so quickly now, get yourself inside the churchyard, and the real fortifications might begin there. Once your men are pulled inside, go about barricading all the yard's gates with beams or logs of wood, and then cut loopholes into the gate about seven or eight feet off the ground. This way, their height will prevent the enemy from using them against you, while you might erect firing steps with dirt or scaffolding behind them uh, for your own men to step on. Then cut another set of loopholes, this time at the bottom of the gate, almost even with the ground. These will be too low for the enemy to reliably reach you when they're trying to cut through, and by digging ditches between the firing steps, you might allow your men easily to fire outside of them. Three and a half feet deep should be sufficient. Then, if the churchyard's walls are high enough, continue that same system, digging loopholes all down its length with ditches and scaffolding to access them. The result will be bristling muskets all across the line as if they were cannon sticking out the hull of a ship. The ability to block up doors with wood and to construct uh, scaffolding, as the author describes it, is going to be very important here. Uh, the interior of the church should be filled with things like pews and other furniture, as well as, one would expect, uh, masonry and carpentry equipment and such, all of which could be a massive help to you in this process. Uh, but all the same, if you're in a real pinch and supplies are lacking, you might also use dirt for all of this. Uh, it's just probably going to take a little bit longer, uh, and it might limit your ability to do certain things, uh, like building that secondary set of uh, lower down loopholes, uh, because obviously a scaffolding you can go underneath, but a giant dirt mat, not as much so. Uh, now, if that yard wall uh, is actually too high to like reliably build that little firing step, uh, you can actually then break down the top of the wall, just hammer away at it, picks, shovels, musket butts, whatever you have to do, but take down the very top of that wall and then use that same debris to uh, construct a sort of a banquette uh, behind it for the men to then step up on, um, which is going to be a lot faster than using the dirt to build up the platform. Uh, and alternatively, on the other end of things, if the wall is too short, well then, simple enough, just have your men dig in behind the wall, uh, you know, as close as they can uh, until, uh, you know, deep enough then until the wall is tall enough to provide them with sufficient cover. While that's all going on, have another party of men digging a trench line outside of the walls, although you do need to be careful not to dig so close to them that you'll affect the foundation and weaken it to artillery. The ditch should be about four feet deep and twelve across, and pointed at the bottom. Now this process is going to generate a lot of soil, but if you can't use that soil in your defensive works anywhere inside the structure, such as in filling gabions or building firing steps, then it is of the utmost importance that you scatter that soil as much as possible. You must avoid leaving over any heaps which the enemy may use for cover later on. And likewise, if there are any trees around the churchyard, make sure to cut them all down. They may even be laid inside the ditch, branches and all, to further impede the enemy. And 
though it surely must pain any truly gentle men officer, if there should be any thatched houses in the neighborhood, they must be uncovered immediately and the straw burnt. If they are even covered with tiles, it is likewise necessary to unroof them to prevent the enemy taking possession of them and firing from the barracks, which, overlooking the churchyard, would soon render it too hot for the troops to remain. Indeed, as much as is possible, all of the homes and other structures surrounding the fields of fire must be torn down, and such efforts must surely provide necessary materials, of course, for the building up of those same defensive works. Even the local hedgerows and gardens must be uprooted and torn apart, thrown into the trench works before the walls. In short, every possible means must be used to discover the enemy on whatever side they may make their approach. And when all these precautions are taken, a garrison who do their duty steadily will not easily be forced without cannon. But if the enemy bring artillery and make a breach in the wall, it is even necessary to endeavor defending the breach, particularly when the post must be held out to the last, by filling it with logs of wood and setting them on fire by some of the volunteers. Still, though, while fire and smoke may deter the enemy for some time and distract their firing, it shall not be sufficient to outlast a determined opponent as you may face. And so if the enemy do manage to break down through the outer defenses, well prepared though, you may, though uh, they may be, you still will have no choice but to fall back into the church itself. And thus even the house of God itself must be made ready. Above all else, the enemy must be prevented from fighting their way into the church, for at that point all would be lost. For that reason, you must defend the main doors at any cost. Construct around them a palisade or a wall out of wooden planks some ten feet long and six inches thick, and driving them at least three feet into the ground that it might take on the appearance of a squared redoubt of sorts. If you don't have access to wood that strong, then you might reinforce the walls by nailing on additional planks. But above all else, it is vital that the walls be capable of stopping musketry, lest your men be exposed. Then, into this wall, you might drive additional loopholes, preferably at least six feet off the ground and three feet apart from each other. In front of this wall as well, another pointed ditch might be dug, using the soil to form an earthen banquette to access the loopholes behind the wall. However, unlike the outer defenses, these works must have at least two small gaps, one to either side, through which defenders might pass into the second line securely should the first of them fall. It's also possible that after the enemy witnesses how impressive these works are, that they'll bring in grenades to try and clear you out of the works. To guard against it, if you have the time and materials, you might find constructing a sort of roof above the palisade to be beneficial. Using wooden planks as a platform of sorts, you can place plenty of soil above the heads of your men, and by which means guard them from any resulting shrapnel. You might also use these same principles to construct an initial redoubt around the churchyard's gate, which would also provide you with the benefit of a potential crossfire to any enemies attempting to reach the walls themselves. And finally, we come to the structure itself. Your last bastion, your final line of defense, your last best hope. But do not expect your salvation to come from prayer, young gentlemen, for deliverance is through preparation and plenty of loopholes. To both provide your soldiers an avenue of escape and to deny the enemy access to the church interior, cut an opening into the church's main gate approximately three feet wide and two feet off the ground, by which only one man can pass at a time. That one's very important if the ab opening is too large or basically just inviting the enemy in. Then you might cover that gap from the inside of the gate with a pre-made door of planks, making sure to as well bar it from the inside. The rest of the gate you want to barricade as thoroughly as possible so that the enemy should make it far enough into your works. This would be their only path inside where one by one they may be dispatched. Within the church, should its windows prove high enough that the enemy may not use them to fire into the building, erect additional scaffolding inside for the defenders to fire out of them. And if they are lower down, block up the lower portions of the windows with beams and planks of wood until they are covered some eight feet from the ground before again constructing the same scaffolding or firing steps. 
Loopholes must likewise be pierced into the walls of the church, all round if not too thick, and if there should happen to be galleries, they may serve very well instead of scaffolds, and the loopholes must be opened accordingly. There should also be another row of loopholes within seven feet of the ground, and the seats and benches of the church, used by the troops by way of banquette. But when the walls are too thick, the loopholes must be pierced between the pillars, where they are generally thinner. The principal thing to be considered in all these kinds of works is to obtain a crossfire. As churches, for the most part, are built in the form of a cross, this advantage is at once gained. And in the ultimate necessity, the very pavement of the church should be lifted, and the bricks and stones carried to the top of the wall in order to gall the enemy when they approach too near. And by these means, the very foundations of the church itself shall aid you in your last stand. Not that it'll be your last stand, of course. I'm sure you'll survive. You'll be fine. And one last note, of course, the author recommends you to prepare plenty of tubs of water that you might use to extinguish any flames that come up, uh, should the enemy be attempting, of course, to, um, uh, uh, should the enemy attempt to, don't make me say it. Burn the church. And that, dear viewer, is how you can convert your church into a nigh-impregnable fortress. Of course, while I hope that this knowledge is entirely useless to you, and that you should never need to make use of such tragic methods of war, unfortunately, the world of military history is one of brutality and tragedy, and oh, there are many Bonapartists in the world who would have it remain so. And before my departure, I wanted to provide you all with at least one account of exactly this kind of thing taking place. Because this wasn't just a thought experiment of some eccentric military theorist, it was a very real instructional guide on how to establish a defensive position in a common environment, uh, ones with which uh, many an army had probably unfortunately found themselves engaged in battle. Now this example is quoted in an account by George Robert Gleig, a British officer of Napoleonic Wars, War of 1812. He did all sorts of crazy stuff. Great account. Read it at nativeoak.org forward slash library. Uh, now, he's describing here some of the defensive works around a French, a French village called Anglais during the battle, or the siege, however you want to phrase it, of Bayonne in 1814, right towards the tail end of the wars. We found this village in the condition in which it was to be expected that a place of so much importance during the progress of the late siege would be found. In other words, completely metamorphosed into a chain of petty posts, being distant from the outworks of Bayonne, not more than a mile and a half, and standing upon the great road by which all the supplies for the left of the British army were brought up, it will readily be imagined that no means were neglected which art or nature could supply towards rendering it as secure against a sudden excursion of the garrison as might be. About 100 yards in front of it, felled trees were laid across the road, with their branches turned towards the town, forming what soldiers, in the language of their profession, term an abati, or abatis. Forty or fifty yards in rear of this, a ditch was dug, and a breastwork thrown up, from behind which a party might do great execution upon any body of men struggling to force their way over that impediment. On either side of the highway again, where the ground rises into little eminences, redoubts and batteries were erected, so as to command the whole with a heavy flanking fire, whilst every house and hovel lying at all within the line of expected operations was loopholed and otherwise put into a posture of defense. But upon the fortification of the church, a more than ordinary degree of care seemed to have been bestowed. As it stood upon a little eminence in the middle of the hamlet, it was no hard matter to convert it into a tolerably regular fortress, which might serve the double purpose of a magazine for warlike stores and a post of defense against the enemy. With this view, the churchyard was surrounded by a row of stout palings, called in military phraseology, stockades, from certain openings in which the muzzles of a half a dozen pieces of light artillery protruded. The walls of the edifice itself were moreover strengthened by an embankment of earth to the height of perhaps four or five feet from the ground, above which narrow openings were made in order to give its garrison an opportunity of leveling their muskets, whilst on the top of the tower a small howitzer was mounted from which either shot or shell could be thrown with effect into any of the lanes or passes near. It is probably needless to add that the interior arrangements of this house of God had undergone a change as striking as that which affected its exterior. Barrels of gunpowder with piles of balls of all sizes and dimensions now occupied the spaces where worshippers had once crowded, and the very altar was heaped up with sponges, wadding, and other impediments necessary in case of attack.
We often imagine the wars of the long 18th century as being fought in vast open fields between politely lined up soldiers fighting their gentlemanly war of honor away from civilian centers and such. But that wasn't always the case. In fact, it often wasn't the case. And the vision of a desecrated church surrounded by burning homes and set within a dying landscape, it doesn't just belong to modern eyes and the First World War, Second World War and such. Images like that, they were all too terribly familiar to a much older world as well. And it's important, I think, to remember that. Now, thank you all so very much for watching, and especially, of course, to my ever-generous supporters on Patreon, who, by their support, have made this and all of my work possible. Thank you also to Call of War, the free World War II online PvP strategy game, for sponsoring this video. Uh, remember to follow the link in the description below to choose your country and fight for victory with 13,000 gold and one month of a premium subscription, all for free. And until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.